Hey friends, this is Dave Taylor coming at you again. We're going to actually be doing a little bit of a, a special series called Conversations. Try and do this, I don't know, every other week. And I'll be having conversations with people that have been down the path for a while. It really helps when you're first starting out to hear some other people's perspective. Now, fair warning, everyone's journey is completely unique in this, in this uh, spiritual pilgrimage that we're on. And so when you listen to stories, resist the urge to compare yourself to the person who's talking, but see what the spirit can do in terms of helping you glean what you can from their stories, because everybody's different. Our first conversation this week is with my good friend, Steve Chandler from Sydney, Australia. He's an incredible guy and he's gone through an incredible journey. We met, I first met him on the Alaska pilgrimage in uh, Willow, Alaska a number of years ago. He traveled all the way from Australia to come and spend some time with us. And his story is an amazing one and wanted you to hear it. So we got together on Zoom a few weeks ago and he gave us permission to, to go ahead and let post his story here so you could hear it. So enjoy, this is Steve Chandler. Sydney, Australia. Yeah, we're good. And it's winter there, right? You said it was cold and rainy? Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look so I've got the fire going. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> yeah. That's well, so it, it's 8 a.m. Sunday. Yeah, 8 a.m. Sunday morning. And it's probably about, in Fahrenheit, it's probably about 50 degrees outside. So okay. it's pretty fresh. Yeah, yeah. And I was, yeah. Planning on being, I was planning on being up in the forest this morning uh -huh. and... Uh, doing it up there with the kookaburras and oh, man, all so the cool. bird sounds. Um, but, but it's raining, so I'm That's inside. Amazing. Well, okay, so I'll just, well, I guess we get, I want to, I just want to ask you some questions about your journey. Um, I, I decided we're going to do these kind of series of conversations with guys that have been on the path, especially guys that have been on it for a while and been working through their own kind of space because one, a lot of the questions that come up on the Facebook group and stuff is just about how, I'll rephrase it this way. A lot of people feel like this is supposed to be a more communal experience and that what happens to you happens to me. It's more formulaic, you know, that there's a, a process that kind of we all go through the same type of thing and people are finding that, oh, no, that's not true. Everyone kind of has a unique thing and unique set of, set of circumstances, but also a, a unique uh, way of approaching their own spiritual life. And so I think it would be really beneficial for guys that are coming in and that are new that are reading the book for the first time, or they're working through this stuff for the first time to hear just the, the variety of different stories from guys that have gone, mm -hmm. before, you know? And so yeah. I, I was hoping that you just kind of take some time and um, we can just have a conversation, but just start out by kind of telling us just a little bit about your story, how you came to um, how you found the materials, but also how you, how you kind of where you got to that point and why, where you started reaching out and looking for, for help and healing, mm -hmm. I think so. When when we hear when I know of yours and Seth's story and your journey and how you know it was like bang instant freedom from mm -hmm. after you know from porn addiction after um, you know after doing sessions and with Floyd and um, it's not the same experience and and so the, the, you can create false expectations that you only need to do this and then you're free um, and hence the idea of a journey or a pilgrimage. Um, is not the path to freedom because mm -hmm. uh, I heard you talk about freedom and, that, and using that language last night. Um, you know, free, there is the, the freedom can come pretty quickly. Then it's just a matter of how you, what mm -hmm. life choices you make. Right. Um, just, uh, I also um, managed to watch, I think the first video you guys shot when we're in um, Alaska, the first time round up in, Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And listening to you and Rebecca was there and Seth came up at uh, when you were talking about, your dad yeah oh i could see yeah you had some real emotion there it was yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It was, and it, it really it really got me i was yeah i was um tearing up listening to you again wow. because it was pretty personal for me too yeah. <laughs> but going back there yeah, yeah yeah and just thinking wow well, well, tell what's us what's happened since then yeah let's talk about that like first of all like how how did you end up in alaska and where and then uh and then what's life been like since then like what's that journey mm -hmm. okay well i'll just start that i'll just start that um bit of a story but um you know i th I, th I think um my 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 journey um or my porn porn addiction unbeknownst to me probably started when i was about 12 years of age and i never called it addiction or anything i just you know dad had the playboy magazines under the bed and 
mm-hmm. you know, as a curious 12, 13 year old, what, wondering what girls look like, um, I discovered them. And so it was probably my first introduction to, to females and, and, and nudity. But it was something that was, you know, titillating. It ex- excited me. <clears throat> and I didn't, even, I didn't even know at that age that I was masturbating. I just, like, I remember one time there was you know, stuff on the sheets going, oh, what is that? <laughs> I had no idea. But, but it was, it was um, probably, um, it, was, it, it probably be, it became that sort of hook. And, um, and as I got, went into my teens, you know, my, my friends would look at, um, look at magazines. So it seemed to be a natural boy experience and I didn't beat myself up or anything like that about it. Um, yeah, and I know when I got my driver's license, uh, made a mate of mine I, and myself would go to the drive-in, and which is I don't know if you know what a drive-in is. <laughs> drive-ins <laughs> over there. Some of that, I think <laughs> maybe the, quarantine has kind of brought that back here in the states. So now people are kind of going, "Oh, well, he's this thing you drive and see a movie." You know, okay, you can do that. You know? Yeah, we we used to drop, go to the drive-in and watch these R-rated movies, and some of them were just so bad. Um, <laughs> they were just so poorly done. But you know, we want. Uh, there was, you know, there were tits and bums and stuff like that, and and that was, that was what what I got off on, and um, you know, in, so into my twenties, um, there were relationships, and I, you know, lost my virginity, and uh, by then, and um, I was having sexual relationships, um, and thinking that I didn't really need to look at magazines anymore, but you know, in the time, but there were still times when, so so back in those days, because I'm fifty eight now, so back in those days. There were no, there was no internet. Right. You had to go to a shop and buy a magazine. So just have working up the courage to go to a shop and having some young girl at the counter, you know, here you go and <laughs> try and pretend it's all innocent and you're right. buying a magazine. But I tell you, when I got the magazine, I got such an adrenaline rush because yeah. I was going home with this magazine. I was going to explore these naked pictures. Um, uh, but it was still... <sighs> You know, there was still no, there was still nothing um, sinister or anything about it. Just like you know, I like looking at girls, and that was a normal thing for for a male. And yeah. and I was sexually active for, for quite a lot of my twenties. But um, and you know, I went through I went through some pretty stressful periods in my in my late twenties. I've been through a series of few jobs and been dismissed. And so in my third, in, when I was in my early thirties, I went overseas for a few years. And really, there was there was well, while I was traveling, there was no opportunity to, to look at magazines or pull, and, and there was, seemed to me no pull because there was so much going on. And um, yeah. even when I lived in London for for a year or so, there was nothing nothing happening. But when I um, when I came back, it was when um, you know a friend, a, a girlfriend, she invited me to to go to church, and that was in my early thirties when I you know gave my life to the Lord and did that whole the whole Christian. Thing and understood sin and repentance and uh, but um, it very quickly became uh, I very qu- uh, quickly became aware that you know, porn was a big no-no in the church and uh, you know you need to flee because it was sinful and you know, if if the if your eyes cause you to sin then you need to gouge them out and so there was a lot of um, th- that was probably when the shame and the guilt kicked in because I I, I then realised that um, was I now I liked looking at um, magazines, and even even probably even back then, I don't even think I um, I discovered that there was uh, internet. In fact, I think I stumbled completely innocently across the internet when I put in a, a Google for um, a company I worked for. But rather than putting .com .ie, I think I just had .com, and there was a porn site. And instantaneously, there was this world yeah. of internet uh, porn that uh, was available to me. And so in my work premises, um, I, um, you know, from time to time, I would be you know, looking at porn and, and my business partner came, worked out that that's what I was doing. And so um, uh, um, my business partner and I both knew each other through the church. In fact, that was how I got to know him and he joined, and we joined business together. Um, and he had also had struggled with porn. Um, so there was, that's where I, I discovered Triple X Church, um, you know, the accountability. And um, because we, we knew that there was some sort of software out there that, well, I think I Google software to say, well, how do I, um, if I'm looking at it at work, how do I um, make myself accountable? So yeah. my business partner was on the email address and 
So, um, in fact, I had the IT guy put blocks on it. But, you know, the thing was, it just made it more, it made it more challenging to access. Right. But I could still access it. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I could still, I could, I could still access it without my accountability partner finding out. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, I think there was, um, uh, um, what is it? Uh, there's one website, um, where there's just lots of people put up, um, just images and stuff like that. You can still, you can say, you can still find it if you really want to. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I um, um, so it was it was a, it was a struggle, and of course um, in the church, guess what? Yeah, there's a book called Every Man's Battle, and uh, so that was sort of the the go-to for me. And yeah, it's a battle and a struggle, and uh, you just got to avert your eyes. And um, right. but uh, I, yeah, I was I was I was losing that battle. Yeah, and um, I was losing that battle, and uh, so. Um, yeah, you know, as a as a Christian and and measuring myself against you know Jesus, I was I was a big time big time sinner, mm. and um, and so I did I really wanted to flee and I really didn't want to be um, uh, looking at porn. But you know, I had to acknowledge that you now I was fairly hooked, but I never used the language of addiction. Mm. Um, it was just that hey yeah, and 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 really the the question of can you do without it. Yeah, you know, that I'd never actually posed myself that question because there were periods where it wasn't really um, something that I, I I went to or looked for, sure. and yeah, that could that could be a few months. Um, I married in my I married when I was forty, so I got to forty, and I'm in a I'm still in the church, and I met I met a Christian woman, and I remember the uh, the pastor of the church saying, "Well, what are your intentions for this woman?" And I said, "What do you mean?" And and she quite crudely. She, I still remember quite cruelly said, "Well, if you're not going to shit, get off the toilet." <laughs> so well she was pretty blunt. <laughs> pretty blunt. So I, I, so I, I sort of went through the, the 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 mental analysis of, well, she ticks all the boxes, mm. and and I desire marriage, and now yeah, so I, I I should ask her, and um, um, yeah, so um, we got married, and before you knew it, we had two two girls. Um, she was almost pregnant soon after we got married, and um, uh, but we had a really tough we had a tough marriage. She was she was pretty explosive. I was pretty explosive. We, I think we triggered the crap out of each other, mm. and the you know, language triggered. <laughs> um, yeah. That was probably not even not even a word that I would use back in those days. We just fought, and um, and having two two young girls it was was really was yeah just babies having young kids just made it even harder and uh, we bought our house and um yeah, i was doing lots of work in the house which i am again <laughs> with this property but um yeah and also there was an anger there you know i just i just remember my youngest just crying one day and i i almost lost it with her and and i thought this is and i just was so beaten up with guilt and shame that this is my child and here I'm getting angry because she's crying, and yeah. she's crying. Babies do that. Kids do that. Yeah. And um, anyway, um, you know that marriage ended. Uh, didn't even make it five years, and so we spent a pretty horrible three years in court, fighting over. Well, there was fighting over kids and money and stuff like that. And it was during that period. I mean, that was probably one of the lowest points of my life. I remember just getting on my almost on my knees and begging my wife not to leave me that we need to sort it out because for, um, for us, um, Chandlers don't divorce. And I was the first one in, in my family that actually went through divorce. Right, right. So during that period, it was pretty ugly. I was at a pretty low point and I think I was probably um, yeah, masturbating a lot and looking at porn and... And um, and that's when I met Beata, who's my current wife. And uh, you know, she moved in to the studio, and you know, within a period of three months, I was pretty much in love with her. And then we had this worldwide romance. We went to Germany to visit, you know, meet her family, and you know, I was um, yeah, went from the lowest point to the highest point. She's a beautiful young woman, and I kept. I you know, just think this dialogue in my head over and over again. Wow, she's seventy years younger than me. What a stud I must be! You know how 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 good am I to hook this young girl? But um, the porn still was there, yeah. and um, it was probably until Jeremiah came along. So we got married 
um, within, I think, 18 months of meeting each other. And Jeremiah came along about nine months <laughs> after yeah. we got married. So he's now, he's now eight, going on nine. Right. And it was really during that time of Jeremiah being born and just the challenge of, of how Beata was with Jeremiah. First of all, you know, he's sleeping in her room. She's breastfeeding for four years. There's, no, there's not a lot of intimacy between us. And then as Jeremiah got older, he um, just somehow knew to push my buttons. Sure. And, um, you know, more language, what does pushing buttons mean? But Jeremiah just had this ability to really upset me and to the point that the anger was, there was unproportional anger and that was something I experienced with, with my other children. Mm. So um, I knew there was some anger that I, that I hadn't dealt with, but I didn't know how to deal with it either. But um, yeah, then I, I suddenly I was having dramas in my second marriage. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was thinking, here we go again. And the idea of going through a divorce a second time scared the living shit out of me. <laughs> and um, not only because we had we had a son, yeah. But you know, a second divorce and paying child support and another, and financially it's disastrous. I mean, it was disastrous first time around. So. Um, um, it was uh, it was actually around May um, 2000 and uh, so when was when was was it 2016 or 15 I think it was I think 15. Alaska first time 15 I think 15 it was. Yeah. yeah so it was actually May 2015 when um, the uh, I got a, an email from Triple X Church and uh, this is when you guys were talking about your um, you know it feels like redemption your book and so I had actually ordered a copy of it. And it was it was pretty well that the, I was reading that book. Beat had moved out. She was moving out of our apartment. We'd sold our house in Avalon. We were living in um, in Monavale in an apartment. She was moving out, and you know there was that "Don't come near me." Um, she was fearful. It was horrible. Um, it was a really really horrible time. And um, I'm reading this book. And suddenly this, the most amazing epiphany moment I had was, um, you know, it's porn's not the issue. What are you medicating? Yeah. And she's walking out the door and I'm reading this. And it was like the biggest aha moment. And as much as, it was, as, much as her leaving um, was, was horrible, I almost immediately had a sense of, I, I, the first time I, I'm actually medicating, there's, there's something else. There's a deeper issue, and um, and it didn't take me too long to work out that there was a deeper issue I needed to sort out. And um, so, reading your book and just reading your story about your dad yeah. and losing your dad, and oh, yeah, yeah um, I knew that there was um, there was part of me that was was missing, and that there were, there were um, traumas as as a child. And I know that when I was seven years of age, I was run over by a car. And um, there was um, there was a huge emotional trauma, physical and emotional trauma on my body, right. and uh, so um, yeah, that was that I, I could almost immediately point to that straight away. Mm -hmm. That was that was that was where the trauma was, mm -hmm. um, and as well as you know my father and the way he was absent, but at, he was there but not there, and right. the way that you know we were shut down. You know, I used to really upset my mum really push her buttons sure. so dad would just come down to me like a ton of bricks and you now you get sent to your room so you, when when you're a kid and you've got all these big emotions and you didn't know how to deal with it rather uh, like anger rather than uh, having parents who help you deal with it they you got punished and sent to your room right. anyway so the uh so that was may 2015 and you guys were organizing something up in alaska and like i think i was the first one to book i just thought right, i'm at, well, i have to go yeah. Yeah. I had. I just knew I had to be there. Yeah. So um, I think that was August of 2015. It was. It was. Um, suddenly, yeah. I suddenly found myself up uh, on a plane coming from Sydney uh, all the way up to Alaska, and uh, yeah, I, I was confronting, confronting, confronting my trauma, and and taking ownership and responsibility and. And, but the thing is, I, I felt there was a solution. I felt that there was a way of getting freedom yeah. from this. And of course, I knew then by then, I knew by then I was a porn addict. Yeah. 
and it was just to be able to sit in a room with or sit outside yeah. um, around a. I don't know if we had a fire. I think we had a fire going um, around a fire with twenty other guys uh, who were, who looked pretty normal to me, you know, yeah. and and intelligent and educated and guys who had careers and professionals and go, hey, I'm in company of guys who are in the same situation as me. Okay, yeah, um, yeah it was. Yeah, there was no shame. No, like, I- we're all dealing with this. There was a lot of there was a lot of surprise around that group. It was interesting at first. I think everybody was kind of doing that and looking around at each other and going, what? like, and and everybody was, when they, every each person kind of had a chance to tell their story. They were also talking about um, the uh, there was a I remember people going, well, that person seems successful. That person. I mean, we had like some professional athletes and we had you know pastors and we had business people and stuff like that. And I think I think that came as a shock to everybody. Not not to Seth and I, but but to, to all the other guys. I remember everybody looking at each other and then feeling that at the same time, kind of what you're describing, that whole, uh, oh, I'm not alone in this. Like, I'm not alone in this, you know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, go on. Like, what was your experience like at that, uh, in Alaska, at the retreat? Get on a plane from Sydney, go to Alaska. <laughs> you're really out of your, you're just in another another world, another, another place. So it was really exciting. But it was it was just to take me out of where I was and dump me in another place, so I could just be um, with me and be with a bunch of guys. Yeah. We could all share our stories and go. You know what? It's like it's okay. Mm-hmm. We're not. Uh, you said you said we're not alone here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the you guys getting up and doing those sort of, um, you know, doing the talks and talking about, um, you know, some some of the language of quantum physics and uh, energy and <laughs> I was like, Hey, this is, um, you, you don't really understand it. And until you start and, and fast forward a few years and I have a, a, a much greater understanding of ego and spirit and presence and breath and all those sorts of things and triggers and, you know, the dark shadow and you know, the sort of language that we start to use. But you now I, I work as a financial advisor and I use language all the time with, that uh, to do with um, what I do as a professional. I've just got to be mindful when I'm talking to clients that I can actually speak to them in a way that they understand. Otherwise, there's no point. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and as you mentioned, yeah, language can just even words can mean different things to different people. Mm-hmm. But uh, the idea of this being a pilgrimage or a journey was um, or a, and a, you know, a path to freedom mm-hmm. um, is really appealing because uh, it's not a quick. It's not a quick fix. There's um, there's healing. There's healing to be done. The idea of subtracting rather than adding, you know, subtracting the the stuff. The idea that um, you know the how our bodies vibrate at a certain frequency and how we go into the forest. And we just you know, there's a lot of stuff that just made sense mm-hmm. when we started having these conversations. Mm-hmm. And so um, when I could quickly work out that there was um, there was trauma. And there was stuff going with my with my parents. Um, I, yeah, I felt that there was a there was a, a path a pathway for me to follow. Yeah. And of course, I had um, knowing that I was going all the way to Alaska. I'd booked an extra couple of weeks for travelling, but also I'd booked in to have, I think I had three or four sessions with Floyd. Mm-hmm. That's right. right. Um, so yeah. So after our little time together, I was at the White Raven Centre and. Uh, yeah, you know, I've never ever experienced something like that before. But um, yeah, you know, when you describe the the almost uh, well, I think of that movie, The Green Mile, and mm-hmm. where he he does that healing, and he's and he's got to cough all that all that poison, all that yeah, yeah. all that energy out. And uh, you know, I was you now lying down, and the blindfold on, and you know, Floyd started you now started you now just getting the breath going and then before you know it, I was just in that place and I was visualising, you know, as a little boy who'd been run over and he was part of him was still stuck in that hospital in Wagga Wagga and I could see him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see. uh, Like there's the wind through the wavy curtain around the bed and, and there he was, and um, he was alone, and he was scared. Mm. And uh, mum and dad weren't there. Mm. 
He was left alone. He felt abandoned and he was scared. He didn't know how to find his way home. So that was, that was when I was seven. Here I was in Alaska, I don't know, what, 40, uh, 52 or something? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of years. The work I did with Floyd um, um, was immense and uh, a lot of, you know, and it, it, well, there's just a lot of stuff. I, I guess I moved out of my body. A lot of that repressed, um, whatever you want to call it, it was repressed anger, energy, um, it was coming out in a way, and there was a lot of crying. Um, there was anger. I mean, there was. I remember the baseball bat and bashing that, and all sorts of stuff. And Floyd was pretty good at getting me uh, <laughs> triggering, you know, bringing up that stuff. So um, that uh, just the, the amazing peace you had after having a session with him. And um, so uh, anyway, um, that was that was my time in Alaska. Of course, going home, um, uh, Beard had. Bit and I had managed to sort things out, but um, it, we really weren't there. We um, we hadn't really got to the point where we thought. You now, I certainly felt vulnerable. I thought, yeah, I think there was part of me that just thought, oh, this marriage is going to end as well because I'm not worth it. Sure. Yeah, I don't deserve. I don't deserve her. Right. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, I but I then met these guys. Um, up in Alaska, and so particularly, you know, Jason, Mark, and uh, Jared, and a couple other guys, we were doing. Um, you know, we started setting up on a on Zoom meetings, um, and that was incredibly supportive and, and helpful. Um, I uh, I did. Um, I think uh, so. That was a year be- from the next pilgrimage, and so during that year, um, yeah, my marriage is my my marriage is really shaky and uh and i think i realized that um the things that attracted my first wife and i together and and i guess with with my current wife with Pieta was that we were all we were all carrying trauma and um so if we were if we had this energy of trauma in our bodies um that was quite dense whatever there was this sort of like attracts like but um we were like mirrors to each other. We were just reflecting the garbage back to each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so um, I just remember w- with the guys just praying and hoping that I could actually get Beata to come up to Alaska. So when you guys announced pilgrimage part two, yeah. um, and I and, and Beata said she'd come up. So we uh, we came up. And um, so she, was, she went to the White Raven Centre. And in fact, uh, we did some travelling again. But um, yeah, she stayed for another month. So yeah. I got on the plane, took Jeremiah home, and you know that um, that rage and anger that I had with Jeremiah that hasn't been there ever since. Um, that's mm-hmm. been years. He still he still can be a little annoying shit. I, I know. As kids are, I got three of those guys. Yeah. Kids are, yeah. yeah. That's that's their jo- that's their job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, I just that anger is no longer there. Yeah, you know, that anger is no longer there. It's yeah. it's gone. So the unproportional rage or whatever is no longer there. And um, so I did some more sessions with, with Floyd and I sort of think, well, how many, how many of these sessions can you have? I mean, how long do you keep going? I mean, I, I think you can keep going and going. Yeah. But I also didn't want to, I didn't want to be a, um, you know, there's a point where, and I think your words, David, were that you've got to become your own self healer, you know, your own spiritual guru, if you like, and, and have the tools available to you to um to do the work yourself because you can't just well i just can't keep turning up at the white raven center because it's a long way away yeah. and keep doing sessions with floyd i don't want to become a a white raven center junkie or even if it was around the corner i wouldn't want to be you know every month turning up there to think well i need to get my fix because yeah. you're not you're not really taking responsibility i think um now we uh both Beth and I have been on that journey together. She went to the White Raven Center. She came back, and since then, we've both done the, the Hoffman course, um, which was amazing. Of course, Hoffman's a lot about um, the, the wounded child with the parents and how we go down the path of understanding what our parents are imperfect. Mm-hmm. And um, now we do the... We do the forgiveness, and but there's a lot of healing there as well. So that was an, an amazing week. Um, but that was uh, so. That's going back about I think 
three three years ago now. But you know, the big question is: do I do I, do I feel shame and guilt? And um, and I think that was. Yeah, you know, the the church was the catalyst for me to find freedom, if you like, in a in a bizarre way. Yeah. Because because if it had not been for me going to church, I wouldn't have had the shame and guilt. I might have still been looking at porn, still had the anger and stuff like that. The church sort of drove me to that place of shame and guilt, but it wasn't the solution for freedom or or um, dealing with my addiction. But the fact is, it was the catalyst to 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 drive me to to do something about it. And uh, really, it was. Um, and you know, Triple X Church, and then you guys reaching out to 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 people like it, myself. He said, "Well, hey, you know, we found we found a way to to deal with our addiction and get freedom." And um, so that for me, that's that's been my path as well. So the the shame and guilt is was certainly no longer there. Um, the other thing is that um, I really um, you know the transformation or the um, or the change in me in terms of how I used to be as a Christian, I was fairly judgmental. Right. Um, I was fairly, um, you know, if you're not a Christian, you're not going to get saved and all those sorts of things. And the language, the, 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 the church's language and this, like, we're all okay. I mean, I know when I went through divorce and I was in the church, the church just doesn't seem to know. I mean, people just don't know how to, know, seem to know how to deal with other people suffering. Um, and in the church, you're supposed to, everybody's supposed to be okay. You know, we've got God. You know, God is good. He loves us. And, you know, he's got the best plans for us. And everything will turn out all right. Just trust him. And you're in the middle of a divorce and losing half your assets and fighting over your children. You think, well, where's God in all of this? I really haven't. I mean, I don't go to the church anymore. Um, I, I just, and, and the organized religion just doesn't seem to sit with me anymore. Um, when I hear conversations that you guys still talk about Jesus and, and the Bible and, and some of the teachings of the Bible, I think, yeah, there's so much of that is great. There's so much wisdom in the Bible and so, and so a lot of Jesus' teachings um, really you know, gravitate with me. Um, but going to church is not something that I choose to do. And, in fact, the, most of the guys that I meet, I met in Alaska, we still meet every, every Friday. None of them go to church anymore. Um, and it's just, I don't feel that's missing in my life either. Yeah, you know, fast forward fast forward to now. Um, you know, Beatrice yeah. and I have been married almost 10 years now. Um, <laughs> that's great. Our life seems to be fairly, our life seems to be fairly well on track. Yeah, it's not, I mean, there's no what's perfect or there's no measure of that. You know, relationships are messy and yeah. and we have, we get tired and we get, we get cranky about things and something, we have different opinions. I mean, Beatrice is 17 years, years younger than me and, She's German and I'm Aussie and she doesn't like Australians a lot of the time and I don't like arrogant <laughs> Germans a lot of the time. So, you know, but we, we, and we've got, I've got two daughters from my first marriage. So there's a blended um, marriage there, which, you know, and the girls uh, come from a different, when they come from their mum's place, it's very different there to, to here. And, um, but would I, would I change my situation for anything? No, not at all. And, um, yeah, um, I would absolutely say that um, you know, I'm free of porn addiction, um, and I do feel like there is a choice now. Right. And so that was the you know, which you guys are talking about on your second podcast about the choice. Yeah. yeah, we 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 don't feel like there's no choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I have a greater awareness of what's going on. You know, the the um, being able to get out of my head um, and. You know, I guess I understand, you know, the ego um, had, had developed this narrative over many, many years that, hey, Steve, you know what you like to do. Yeah. You know, porn's your thing. It, it makes you feel better. That's, you know, and that's the ego's job. You know, occasionally that little, it's like an old friend. Um, mm-hmm. he, um, he, he, he quite often just sort of passes through the neighbourhood, I think, and yeah drops in and says, yeah, I'm still around and yeah. going, yeah, I know, I see you, but, yeah. um, you know, thanks. Right. Thanks. But, uh, <laughs> don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. You, 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 I guess you served your purpose because it was pain yeah. and I needed to numb out to, so I wouldn't feel it. And, um, but it, you know, for me, yeah, I'm, yeah, for me, porn is destructive. Yeah. I see porn as being, um, first of all, abusive to, to women because it uh, exploits women. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I think it, 
also Im- impacts on my sexual relationship with with my wife. Yeah. I mean, the intimacy I de- the intimacy I desire with her is not something that's going to be get replicated by looking at porn. No. And it it creates false expectations. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of reasons not to look at porn, and I don't think it heightens your sexual relationship. I actually think it's the, the complete opposite. Yeah. So for me, it's not it's not it's not a place that I I want to go. So um, it's it's been a well, it's been a an, an amazing road since yeah. 2015, um, which is almost five years ago. Yeah. I still yeah. meet with I still meet I still meet with the guys that I met five years ago. Um, pretty well at almost every week. Yeah. We have an hour where we just share. A lot of the time, you know, we're talking about black, you know, all the crap that's going on in America right yeah. now. Love it. Well, the yeah, well, the the common the common uh, glue in that in that relationship with each other is Alaska, yeah, um, yeah. and and the porn addiction and how we've all, you know, we want something better. You yeah, know? we want a freedom from it. We didn't want to be addicted anymore, and we felt this, yeah, you know, this genuine love in that in that group. Yeah, you know? we can say, hey, love you guys. Yeah, and um, and that was something that doesn't feel strange to say. Yeah. You know, with a guy, you know, I love you. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, uh, for me, it's a really important part of my week is to just hook it, connect with these guys, not just so much about myself, but how to give support to the other guys as well. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you know, it only happens because we want to make it happen. It takes a long time to, to strip it all back. Absolutely. And the idea, the idea that we are um, enough. Yeah. Because there's so much when you're in that addiction, and you feel trapped, and um, that there's no choice, right. and you feel, um, particularly in the church, you feel disgusting because you're hooked, and you think nobody else is, right. and yet the, the half the guys are also looking at it, and and they're too ashamed to say to mention it and fess up, right. but um, yeah, to um, to about to um, be free from all that. And to be free from the shame and guilt, and also the, um, you know, getting rid of all the crap, you know, the the, the accumulation of crap <laughs> or energy, whatever you want to call it, over the years, right. is 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 massive. So, um, it, but just being equipped with some tools, yeah, just stop and breathe, you know, just get into your body. Um, we spend so much time in our head, and I, um, and this idea about unworthiness or abandonment. I mean, I, I guess sometimes I, I think about, I wonder about why. The, you know, the porn addiction. Why? Why porn and not alcohol? Or and there's there's plenty of addictions. There's plenty. Of, I, I just think I just I do believe just about everybody has some form of trauma, yeah. and I think it just comes from the fact that parents don't unconditionally love us, and I think that that the traumas get passed on and passed on and passed on. So you know, our parents pass it on to us because we we're not equipped to parent, and so we as a child or a baby, and you know, we go. Hey, you know, why does why isn't my mum here for me right now while I'm crying? And uh, right. um, when Jeremiah says, "Dad, can you come and play with me?" They go, oh, "Not now, son. I'm too busy doing something." It's like, you know, what's Jeremiah thinking at that time? Well, right. aren't I good enough for Dad to yeah. play with me when he wants to go and stick pavers on the ground? Right. Um, yeah, you know, it's like the, those little things can be just as painful and be stuck in our bodies and. Uh, and it accumulates, and so you get to the point where you go, "Well, my parents really never loved me, and uh, you know, well, maybe I'm just not good enough." Sure. And uh, and when you're dealing with all those big emotions like anger, you know, boys shouldn't, you know, we don't get angry, right. but um, you know, we've got to be allowed to express ourselves. And and so Jeremiah, when he gets these big big emotions, and I see Beard allowing him to to um, uh, to, to to move it out, mm-hmm. and then probably the most, for me, the most powerful and connecting times with Jeremiah is when I've been able to hold him through that time, mm-hmm. and he just wants to hit and hurt and all that sort of stuff, and you just hold him, and it all comes out, and he sobs, and eventually, he's just like a baby in your arms, yeah. um, because that's what happens, and you know, we don't help our kids with that, then we end up, you know with some form of addiction to medicate because we start putting on, well, maybe if I am like this, I'll be loved. Sure. Yeah, so uh, anyway, 
anyway, dude, thank you for thanks for taking the time, and please thank yeah, yeah. thank your family for letting you take over the space there, and thank Beardo for well, me. Not a, nine o'clock. They're all they're all still in bed. <laughs>